सो लेक्चर कैन गो स्मूथली सर यू कैन प्रोसीड सर सो I'm. I apologize for yesterday's goof up, but uh, that uh, happens only occasionally. Now, supracondylar so humerus uh, fractures in children is the most common fracture, and uh, there are so many things to learn uh, in this fracture. So let's. Whenever a patient comes to you in a clinic with a swollen elbow, so first don't jump for X-ray, but try to also ask that what is the mode of injury. uh most of the children had fallen on outstretched hand either they have uh, fallen from monkey bars or swings or from a ball or high uh but a very common mode of injury is happening injury in a skating board the children who are trying to learn skating and they fall on their point of elbow so whenever there is a point of elbow or swelling more on the posterior side in the than on the front you can think of a flexion variety of injury you know so Uh, do not jump on the X-ray, but start uh, taking history first, and then comes the important clinical examination. You will see the key clinical examination. There is swelling and pain around the elbow, and uh, many a times we see that the the three point relation in elbow is lost, but uh, the swelling is such that even sometimes you don't you cannot feel any single point, you know, and. when you see this puckering and contusion along the front of elbow that is the sign that the the bone segment has gone through the muscle and it has torn the muscle to produce a, a hematoma subcutaneously it will end up into puckering and contusion when you see puckering that's a sign of soft tissue interposition so whenever you see puckering sign that the brachialis muscle is lying between the two bone segments so these are the key local points as we all know that uh, the vascular and the uh, neural injury is fairly common uh, being a resident you know it's not your job to identify kind of which nerve is injured but whenever you are uh, talking to your trauma surgeon you must tell what movements a child is not able to do because many a times if you fail to identify a nerve injury and the and the parents if they find post surgical some nerve injuries that can become a medical legal issue so when i was a fellow at sick kids toronto our, our instructions to residents were that you tell the uh, the consultant that what movement the child is not able to do so the most common thing is of course you need to feel a capillary uh, refill in the thumb as you can see so the first and foremost thing is if a, if you ask a child to fist the hand and a child is not able to flex the index finger or what what we say it's a pointing index finger that is a sign of anterior interosseous palsy which we see in about 12 to 15 percentage of patients and that is seen into extension variety of uh, supracondylar fracture especially the posterolateral displacement of the distal fragment meaning that that the spike of proximal fragment is on the medial side and it is stretching on the anterior interosseous nerve similarly if a child is not able to extend the thumb or thumbs up you know so that is a sign of posterior interosseous nerve palsy and that we see in about 8 percentage of patients and that we commonly see in extension variety of fracture where the distal fragment is shifted posteromedially meaning that the spike of the proximal fragment is on the radial side and it is stretching on the posterior interosseous nerve so many a times just on clinical examination you can forecast that the in this x ray of this child the the fragment would have moved this way the third injury is when a child is not able to extend the ulnar two digits uh, this is a sign of ulnar cloying what we say is an a sign of ulnar nerve injury which we seen about 3% of patients it's uh, relatively less common than other two nerve injuries and that is seen in the flexion variety of injury so whenever you see pre treatment ulnar cloying then on x ray you must try to find out whether it is a flexion variety of supracondylar fracture or it's an extension variety because the treatment is different in both of them now let us see uh, some case example this is a 5 year old boy a fall on outstretched hand and you can see this is an undisplaced fracture and uh, the anterior humeral line is going through the capitulum so you can see that is going through the capitulum 
So, uh, Shrikund, what is this type of injury? What classification we use for supracondylar fractures? Usually, we use the Gartland classification. Right. So, Gartland is the most commonly used classification. And what now we use the K. Wilkins modifications of Gartland classification. Okay. Because Gartland was a very old classification with only three types. And K. Wilkins has divided each type into subtype and he has added one more type to it. So, yes, this is type 1 injury which is not displaced and on a lateral view, you can see that anterior humeral line is crossing the capitalum and uh, we can treat this conservatively, meaning we can just give an above elbow slab in about uh, uh, 80 to 70 degree of elbow flexion. If there is not much edema, we can give plaster uh, slab into 90 degrees. And then what is your post-treatment protocol for such uh, uh, fracture, Shrikunj or anyone else? How, uh, when you call them back for supracondylars? Yes, any resident After wants to seven an days. answer? Yes. After seven days. Yes, so you, you call them after seven days and then you convert into a complete plaster, right? So that, and usually at this, this age, we keep plaster on for about three to four weeks and that is sufficient time. Right, so let's see another example. There's again a five-year-old boy. There are two sets of boy and here you can see there is case 2.1 where the anterior humeral line is crossing just in front of, it's not through the capitulum but it is in front of the capitulum and the second set of patient there is case 2.2 again the anterior humeral line is going in front of the capitulum. Can someone tell me what is the difference between these two x-rays? Are these injuries same or how it is different? Shrikun, you can tell us. <coughs> yeah, anyone else a wild guess? Sir, periosteal, posterior periosteal hinge is maintained in first image uh, while it's not maintained in second image. Oh, so posterior periosteal hinge is intact in both both the things, but in case 2.2, the distal fragment is rotated, okay. while in case 2.1, the distal fragment is not rotated. When you see this lateral view and you can see the whole tear drop, but here you can see the one of the side of uh, the distal humerus is projecting more posterior than this. So yeah. this is a uh, type two fracture of Gartland, but Gartland type 2 can be divided into 2A, which is only one cortex is broken and there is only hyperextension injury, but in type 2B, you see that distal fragment is also rotated. So what happens that when these two fragments are lying like this, the fracture can get collapsed in 2B. So 2B are the ones, if we fail to fix them, they may collapse in virus and they may lead to cubitus virus deformity. So not all uh, type uh, 2 needs to be conserved. Type 2A can be conserved where we see that there is no rotation of distal fragment. But when it is type 2B, these patients have high rate of uh, uh, getting losing the reduction within plaster and let end up into cubitus virus. So our strategy for 2A is to conserve but when it comes a rotation in the fragment to be, we, we fix it. We fix it with a K virus. Okay. So how we fix it? That is very important. Uh, we know that lateral uh, pinning, uh, and there is two pins. I have. I must. Uh, I want to spare some time on this image. So this is how I fix. What if? Uh, I teach my fellow that first you see the ossified uh, capitulum. Okay. And then you divide capitulum into two halves. So your first pin should pass through this inner half or medial half of capitulum like this. So this pin has four cortex. So first is when it enters into the bony capitulum, then the lower margin of olecranon fossa, then the proximal margin of olecranon fossa and the opposite cortex. So this is known as a four cortices wire. And four cortices wire has significant stability. It's a very stable wire and it gives you good rotational stability. 
and the, your second wire should be going from the outer margin of capitulum or little more laterally and it has two cortex so one is the distal metaphysis or a lateral capitulum and the other is a par cortex so this is two cortex pin which fixes the lateral pillar so this is lateral pillar pin or wire and the key thing on this fixation is the distance between this two pin should be good so the span of your wires in ap plane should be there uh, uh, on the fracture side so more diverge or the wires if now more away we will provide more rotational stability if your wires are crossing at the fracture side there will be less rotational stability so most of the patients with type 1 2 and 3 where posterior hinge of periosteum is intact you can fix with two lateral wires okay so i i like all my fellows to follow this and i like to see this type of uh, x ray picture and you will see some uh, uh, fractures later on so that is the strategy which we follow now let us see this uh, this is a 7 year old boy fell from swing and again you can see that posterior it is not a completely displaced fracture so it looks like type 2 injury again right uh, and someone would say that uh, there is not much rotation here you see there is not much rotation so it may fall into 2a variety and so someone would like to conserve now can one can someone tell me looking at this ap film what is uh, a significant finding on this ap film anyone any resident or fellows or someone varus varus yes varus is there that will be there in most of the patients varus as well as some medial translation that is there rotation any any uh, some amount of comminution exactly that's that's very right so there is uh, not much rotation but there is medial comminution there is a recent article in uh, jpo 2020 and they have found that whenever we see a medial comminution these are the patients who have higher rate of loss of reduction when they they have been treated conservatively so whenever you see there is break of the medial wall or medial combination then these are the unstable situation and we should fix them with a k wire we cannot conserve it yes so again we we have fixed with two wires again you see the configuration of uh, wires my first wire or a medial wire is going from the inner half of capitulum and the lateral wire is fixing the lateral pillar so this should be the you don't need to put multiple wires just two wires and check the stability and then you are it is fine now this is a 8 year old boy fell from monkey bar and here you can see that segment is completely separated both the segments and uh, uh, there is medial comminution also so this is an unstable situation and we can see that there is complete breakage in the anterior periosteal hinge and if we see this is a type 3 so what is peculiar of type 3 that the anterior humeral line passes way ahead of the capitulum and still the posterior hinge or periosteal hinge in children is intact and this posterior hinge is very very uh, strong so type 1 2 or 3 these are all are stable type of fractures so once you reduce them they are stable and you pin them uh, and it is different from some multidirectionally unstable fractures which i'll come to uh, that in a point so now it comes the question about uh, how to pin the supracondylar humerus fracture k wiring and there are multiple questions which will be asked in your uh, exam bywas also uh, and there are clinical answers to the situation the questions can be would you use all lateral wires or you would use cross k wire how many wires should be placed what configuration of wires should be used should we fix all the supracondylar fractures in as an emergency or we can do it on the next day as an elective procedure when to put a medial k wire what precautions we should exercise when we put medial k wires whether to move iitv or to move arm forearm as a single unit you know that's a method uh, question so let's answer this questions one by one 
this is a nice uh, uh, evidence based guidelines published by what i say uh, bishma pitama of pediatric trauma he is dr k wilkins uh, and along with uh, kishore malpure and what they have found in their study is if you put two or three lateral wires it gives similar stability as cross k wire in most of type 1 2 and 3 injuries and so by putting two or three lateral wires you can avoid risk of injuring ulnar nerve uh i i really get um, sad when i see such x rays you know there are some general orthopedic surgeon colleagues they feel that more the wires you put it will increase the stability but more wires you put now for example this child received almost 6 to 7 k wires so more number of wire does not add to stability of fixation but it add to the stiffness and this patients end up in lot of post operative stiffness so i tell my fellow don't make a child a bishma pitama don't put all multiple wires that will not add to any stability so that's a wrong practice you can do to put only two or at the most three that is the stability you don't need more now there are some typical fracture fixation patterns has been found with loss of fixation so you would feel even if i have fixed a fracture after one week we saw that the fracture got collapsed so this is very nice paper and all all the residents should go to this jbjs 2007 paper and uh, the jack flynn and david skaggs they have found three typical patterns of fixation wherein the uh, post operatively the reduction gets loose look at this a figure a on ap plane the play pins are placed very well but if you see in lateral plane one of the pin is going out of the anterior cortex through the fracture site so now your stability is based on only single uh, single wire here so this is not a very stable fixation now this is uh, c x situation b where both of your wires looks intra medullary in the proximal fragment and while one wire is having good purchase in the opposite cortex the second wire is gone like an ender's nail so it's an intra medullary wire which does not have cortical purchase so this is not a stable situation either and situation 3 where you can see both the wires have pierced both the cortex in ap and lateral but both wires are crossing at the fracture site both in ap and lateral so now your there is not enough span of your fixation at fracture site and so there is inadequate rotational stability so in this three situation or configuration of wires you may find loss of reduction post uh, fixation also and they these are the candidates which ends up into cubitus varus or the what you say gunstock deformity later on so you must avoid this so the question is all lateral or cross k wire so i have two indications of putting a medial k wire the first one is this this child is a 5 year old boy again fell from monkey bar you can see the contusion on the uh, anti cubital fossa and uh, we fixed with the two wires you can see this very nice 100% anatomic reduction both in ap and lateral plane right and so this is lateral in external rotation so when a child is lying supine and you fix it the arm is in a bit of external rotation but when we immobilize the children in a sling the arm goes into internal rotation so this should be a principle whenever you finish your fixation try to check under internal rotation and see what happens with this child when i turn it internally you can see the spike of proximal fragment here so this is not a rotationally stable situation and we term it as a rotationally unstable fracture so when a fracture is not stable even after having two nice lateral wire then i'll put a medial wire and i'll fix it so and make sure in internal rotation that rotation Uh, is now stable so that is first indication of mine putting a medial k wire the second condition is this so uh, can someone tell me how this uh, fracture pattern is different than the typical ones we see sorry this is an iitv image but trikun or anyone else is it oblique fracture high medial low lateral fracture ah exactly so 
we term it as a medial oblique fracture line so it's a medial oblique fracture pattern so if we try to put conventional uh, lateral pinning you know if we start from the medial part of capitulum then it would be very difficult to have purchase in the proximal fragment so these are the cases where the medial segment an inferior segment is so big you need to have purchase into that segment and there you need to put your uh, medial wire so we have placed two wires from the medial and one from the lateral so these are the two indications where we use ulnar wire otherwise we don't use a uh, medial wires most of the fractures can be easily treated by lateral wire now if you happen to put an ulnar pin uh, this the points which should be remembered is uh, do not try to pass the pin uh, just as you pass on the lateral side through the skin because of, although ulnar now lies little posterior at times but the sheath around the ulnar now and the soft tissue may get winded around by a power drill and many a times you uh, you may injure due to the produce neuropraxia of ulnar now so Uh, have a habit of making making a small incision a centimeter incision uh, then you can put your wire sleeve or sometimes even i pass a tie uh, wire bender you can put a bender and make sure that you are right on the bone there is no soft tissue lying in between uh, when you extend the elbow uh, the ulnar now goes more posteriorly and it safeguards your uh, wiring and uh, sometimes you when you are putting your wire if the nerve sheath is getting stretched you may see flickering flickering of the ulnar digit so uh, i always ask my fellow to keep an eye on the ulnar digit whenever i am putting a medial uh, wire if it happens so you remove the wire broaden your incision have under vision that you are not injuring the nerve and put wire okay so these four points are worth uh, remembering what would you do if uh, so let me ask someone now when you took an evening round a pachora sir is taking an evening round and uh, some let's say shrikund has fixed the fracture cross wiring and post operatively patient is showing ulnar cloying child is not able to extend the ulnar digits what what would you do shrikund so yes, you sir. find ulnar yes. cloying on the first post operative evening what would be your plan uh yes sir uh, first uh, i i i will uh, go for two things first if uh, post operative immobilization in, is in excessive flexion then i am going to reduce that flexion i am going to extend it and second thing if it's on the same day then i am going to remove uh, uh in situ pins right so the the key thing is whenever after supracondylar pinning of a plaster or a back slab should never be in 90 degree or more than 90 degree flexion it should be about 70 or 80 degree flexion that should be the rule first of all so that is not the cause of ulnar now impinging of course someone has uh, you pay, receive patient from other center where lot of flexion is there you extend it and see but that strategy is right when you see immediate post of uh, ulnar cloying try to uh, remove the ulnar wire or what i'll do i will extend the incision try to put fix uh, my retractors and see what's happening that has happened with a uh, couple of times with us and we see that nerve is lying behind but the sheath is very tight and we try to release the sheath or at times you can change the wire under vision so that should be the practice and many a times we see post operatively child is able to extend the digit and uh, as children are small they may not complain of tingling numbness sometimes you might have to actively ask whenever will you have performed a medial wire or a flexion variety of supracondylar injury so sometimes we see the nerve palsy at as late as 2 to 3 weeks and in those cases we just tend to observe and we have found that when we wait for 6 months to 9 months 95 percentage of nerves they recover because those are neuropraxic injuries and there are some 5% chance that uh, this patients would need exploration neurolysis and in very rare cases when one has gone through the ulnar nerve we excise that uh, nerve segment and treat sural nerve cables so that was about 
medial now medial uh, ulnar uh, medial pinning now the another question is uh, whether you do emergency or elective kvr so pachore say what is your recommendation uh, at shelby what would you uh, teach your if say shrikunj or some fellow is saying that there is a, a supracondylar fracture has come with good distal vascularity and uh, there is no nerve injury would you like to fix them at 12 12 in the no uh, 12 in the night or you can say you say that we'll do it tomorrow morning unless the patient has got some vascular problem then only emergency otherwise we will uh, splint it nicely ask the relation consult the relation and probably we'll do in the next day morning first case and when we are all the staff and everything is ready so that that's a pearl of wisdom you know and uh, some people have done studied this fact and this is a paper published in journal of pediatric orthopedics british volume uh, 2016 they have found that increased rate of suboptimal wire configuration in after hour surgical treatment and they found that unless there is vascular injury or a neurologic deficit uh, there is no need to go right in the middle of night you can always tell parent that we'll fix it tomorrow morning you know many times we have fear that patient would run away from you uh, because you know in this practice thing but with inadequate assistance you may have poor fixation and that will lead to a problem so better you do it in when you are fresh and your assistants are also quite fresh now let me show uh, how i do it you know uh, fracture fixation so we use this technique for most stable fractures type 1 2 and 3 uh on a simple table this is a type uh, type 3 fracture patient is lying on the edge of the fracture table now this video was done up before 10 years so pardon me and uh, so I have a habit of filling pulse volume and then longitudinal traction and uh, uh, you correct the rotation and then as you with traction you flex the elbow give a gentle pressure on the be from behind the proximal or distal fragment then make your coronal adjustments depending on where the fracture is moved a gentle movement will reduce your fracture turn the arm internally with the forearm and check the medial and lateral pillars in stable fractures i have never seen a problem when i turn the arm and forearm as a single unit and this is a small inventory you want for fixation so as i mentioned i have fixed this before many years now we use a uh, synthesis drills and i mean the power drills and these are very stable fractures so you can finish the fixation in about 5 minutes again the second wire to fix the lateral pillar so this both the wires are spanning in both uh, ap and lateral then you check in internal rotation check the rotational stability bend the wire and cut them and this is it so in most of the uh, patients most of the patients uh, we can finish this but there are certain fractures you know which may look very simple to start with now uh, this fracture looks very simple probably a type 3 fracture and when i started manipulating it so on your left you can see iitv image uh, a pre reduction image and then when i started reducing with flexion you see the distal fragment move forward so earlier on it was behind the proximal fragment and now it is anterior to the proximal fragment so this means that both the periosteal hinge the posterior and anterior both are damaged and this is known as multidirectionally unstable fracture pattern so this is k wilkins type 4 so this is uh, gartland wilkins modification of gartland classification type 4 fracture which is multidirectionally unstable 
and you can see that the posterior periosteal hinge which was intact in type 1 2 and 3 supracondyla is damaged here many a times it is difficult to identify on pre operative x ray but intraoperatively when you try maneuver you will see that uh, it's kind of video game if you achieve reduction in ap view then you will lose in lateral view and you get in lateral view then it you will lose in ap view so that's an un in uh, unstable situation so there is a nice paper for this kind of fractures where how to reduce and treat multidirectionally unstable fractures in jbjs 2006 and they authors have mentioned that there should be two surgeons two views and uh, uh and two maneuvers yeah and two maneuvers so you need to do this uh, what do they mean by two surgeons that there should be two trained colleagues because many a times happens so that you have to hold the reduction and other colleague has to drive the wire if you try to do everything by yourself then you may fail to adequately fix it two view means you don't move arm and forearm as a single unit you move the iitv so that you get ap and lateral views because the unstable situation by the time you move the extremity the fracture reduction will will be lost and uh, and then you do two maneuvers so i'll show you what maneuvers it is of course this was fixed like this uh hmm so what maneuvers are done is uh, i have i have lost that slide here but we tend to put a roller pack posterior to the proximal fragment because the proximal fragment has a tendency of going posteriorly and the distal fragment goes in front so one thing you have to put a roller pack many a times we tend to put our wire into the distal fragment beforehand before we attempt reduction so that once the reduction is there you just drive the wire into the proximal fragment and the third is in conventional thing we flex it and push it but here you have to flex and pull it you have to pull upwards to align both the fragment uh, in a line so uh, there is technical slide of this which i which is not there in this presentation i'll i'll share with you guys and this is how you fix it now our colleague friend uh, sandeep patwardhan from pune so uh, this is his uh, way of doing it what he uses is a arm board technique it's a it's a wooden arm board there's a one inch thickness and he places underneath the proximal fragment and uh, strapping and stabilizing the proximal fragment with a micro pore like this you can see the contusion and uh, and the puckering so you have to do a gentle milking maneuver and with this uh, this milking uh, the puckering has disappear and then then you move the iitv you know so in lateral view you can see it was extended and then you flex the elbow and the alignment is there the key advantage of this method is now there is nothing lying in between and you have a place to put your wires from below many times when you use a, a full board or radiolucent board you have difficulties in maneuvering the pins from the distal fragment so this is a very simple technique uh, putting an arm board and then you don't need much much of the assistant so he has placed uh, both ap and lateral view moving the image intensifier and your assistant uh, can move the wire with an artery forceps so this is one more technique and you can uh, use an arm board that's uh, quite helpful now this is a 7 year old daughter of my my friend who while learning skating shared uh, fall on the point of elbow so shrikun ji is it in what type of injury this is is it a typical injury or something something atypical yeah. 
sir both anterior and posterior periosteal hinge has been broken broken so it will be a type 4 wilkins modification of gartle yeah so anyone else uh, anyone else thinks differently is it type 4 injury or something else dr like apna to type 1 uh, gartle uh, सोल्टर सोल्टर ये ये पे पे नहीं आता है। यहां पे नहीं आता आता है है यू यू हैव टू टॉक इन टर्म्स ऑफ इज इट अ टाइप फोर गार्टलैंड विल्किंस मॉडिफिकेशन सो लेट्स सी दिस एज आई आस्ट यू टू यू बिफोर एंड आई आल्सो मेंशन शी सेल्ड ऑन द पॉइंट ऑफ एल्बो वाइल स्केटिंग एंड दिस इज नॉट अ टाइप फोर बट दिस इज This is again an oblique uh, uh, view, so you can see the distal fragment is in flexion. Routinely, we see the distal fragment is in extension. So this is a flexion variety of supracondylar fracture. So flexion variety of supracondylar fracture again needs um, uh, good assistance and good uh, experienced uh, help to fix them very because sometimes it turns very difficult to fix them. So key about flexion variety is it reduces in extension. so it is not uh, like uh, you flex over flex and it will reduce but many and times it reduces in about 30 degree of uh, uh, flexion only and putting a pin when elbow is just 30 degree flex it sometimes it becomes difficult and this fractures have a higher rate of ulnar nerve injuries about 3 to 5% patients with uh, flexion uh, variety has al- associated ulnar nerve injury that means sometimes ulnar nerve might also have trapped between the fragment so with one or two attempt if you don't see a good reduction you go on the medial side open it make sure that ulnar nerve is not lying between the fracture fragments you might need to do open reduction and fix it this is uh, an uh, unstable situation many a times and you might have to use a uh, cross wiring so see this fracture reduced in extension it whenever i flex it went into lot of distal fragment went in front and this was also very low lying fracture so i i did an arthrogram to make sure that uh, it is well reduced and this is uh, how we fixed it in extension and my wires are like this and little bit of uh, antero posterior but this fracture did well she did well there after she rejoined the skating thing so uh, try to analyze each x ray will give you a challenge to analyze them perfectly and each x-ray is not just supracondylar there are a lot of varieties you know let's see this 6 uh, years old boy who fell from slides and uh, it was referred from my very uh, senior orthopedic colleague and we attempted 14 to 15 times to reduce it but it did not reduce under anesthesia and then he said ki isko open karna padega main bhejta hu tere paas na yes please send and there was of course anterior contusion was there but what i found that there was a soft tissue interpositioning how would you uh, identify soft tissue interpositioning my many a time they have puckering and puckering is a, a sign of that but other sign is when you try to flex it you do not feel crepitus you know when the soft tissue is lying in between you will not feel crepitus but the moment you remove or do the what's known as milking maneuver this is not non reducible variety so brachialis interpositioning should be treated with brachialis milking this is also very important paper and this is known as brachialis milking maneuver i'll uh, i did this in a child before some time i have recorded this so sometimes you have to pull the interposed brachialis like this and many a time you feel a pop that the muscle has come out and then when you do that you will start feeling the crepitation so that is the uh, sign of success that you will not you were not able to see feel the crepitation now you feel the crepitation so that's a sign of uh, the uh, interpositioning has gone off and we could treat this child with two simple k wires now the situation of pink pulseless limb which is very common and very confusing also so this 5 years old boy presented to me and you can see that uh, that's a significant puckering and anterior swelling 
and child is having pointing index finger as you can see here and on when i place the pulse oximeter over thumb there was no pulsation so shrikunj what how would you approach this child this child uh, five year old excessive swelling pointing index finger and no uh, pulsation recorded on pulse oximeter mm -hmm. hello sir i would give a first attempt of close reduction and i will then i will ass uh, again assess for vascular status mm -hmm. exactly so uh, any any other uh, uh, any other opinion <laughs> or everyone would uh, uh, would think that what shrikun says is right right so that's a, that's a right approach shrikun uh, and we should fix this fracture as you can see with again with two wires and the moment we fixed uh, the pulse came back so this was a pink pulseless limb and uh, many a times the pulse comes back uh, we are also seen that the pulse sometimes does not come back as early as 2 days or 3 days you know uh, but if the extremity is well perfused then one can wait okay so this is my approach of how we uh, uh, approach and supracondylar with absent pulse so we tend to do here we cannot wait till the next morning so we do emergency close reduction and pinning and see if there is a return of palpable radial pulse or not if it is yes the pulsation is that then you give routine post operative care patient will be discharged home the next day and they will be called back in one week you give back slab in about 70 degree elbow flexion do not flex it many a times you flex it more and it will kink again and pulse will be gone now if even after fixing you don't feel the pulse then there can be two things if it is it's uh, you have to find out whether it's a pink and perfused limb or not if it is pale cold and non perfused then you have to call your vascular surgeon for sure and we would consider immediate arterial exploration but the question is when it is a pink and perfused hand but radial pulse is not palpable then we rely on three factors and those three factors we do radial doppler that's one we see on pulse oximetry what is the waveform how is the waveform and whether saturation is showing more than 95 or not and third uh, factor which is prognosticating arterial injury is a anterior interosseous injury so if there is a no anterior interosseous injury and there is good waveform and positive radial doppler then you can wait but if there is negative radial doppler or there is poor pulse oximetry signal and median nerve pulse is associated there is high likelihood that there is associated arterial injuries and in those cases we ask our uh, uh, vascular surgeons to help us and many a times they need an exploration and for those who had uh, uh, good positive uh, points we keep them indoor for 2 days and keep on monitoring their finger and the bomb and all because some of these patients are known to develop a late compartment syndrome in first week of injury they may come back with a pain and increasing swelling so these patients are explained at the outset that compartment syndrome is a known complication of supracondylar with absent pulse and that the treatment is a uh, an fasciotomy of the forearm if a compartment syndrome develops that happens mainly with a late presenting kids uh, we have not seen this in patients who have presented fairly early uh, after injury but we uh, it's wise to explain the patients parents the worst and let them expect for the best this paper i would recommend everyone to read the pink pulseless hand evaluation and decision making and is there any consensus this is written by my friend dr venkat das from ganga coimbatore and that is published in international journal of pediatrics ijpo 2015 that's a pre article so i think i i have discussed uh, pachore sir the common scenarios there are a lot of atypical situation which i have not discussed here but uh, i think i would like to, i'll answer any questions are there hello sir yes what's your approach 
for the open supra condyle humerus fracture when you want to do open redox yeah so uh, the rate of open reduction is fairly fairly minimum in our practice since we have started using different uh, maneuvers like putting a joystick uh, maneuver uh, to reduce some fractures there are some uh, soft tissue interpositioning you, i think someone's mic is on so when there is a soft tissue interpositioning we tend to put a blunt hemostate and remove that interpositioning so our rate of uh, open reduction has reduced substantially but whenever we require we go from anterior approach whenever you do open reduction it is wise to see the uh, neurovascular pedicles in front of you if there is an ulnar injury or if there is a flexion or supracondylar then it is wise to open from the medial side because there is a chance that medial uh, ulnar nerve is interposed so uh, for those unreducible fractures uh, where our uh, other attempts are also failed i would like to do an open reduction and i do open reduction from the front so that i can easily retract the uh, important neurovascular structures and i can uh, reduce a fracture under vision mole and yes sir in this placement of k wire we learned from dr b b joshi yes the technique is do, uh, don't you start the power reamer right right way so what normally what you said just a small incision open it slightly with a blunt dissection yes hit the wire hammer the wire actually partly and then take your uh, power drill and then because what he said ki whenever you touch the nerve actually nerve slips away from your k wire that was his experience experience yes. so that yes. is one important the important thing that don't get the power right away right that's true so, so uh, he is right and uh, what we have seen when when people they start fast power drilling from uh, from the outset they actually wind the sheath of nerve that's that and, and that's uh, that produces the neuropraxia yeah. so that should be our it's a very good idea to kind of poke your wire hammer it a bit and then once it enters you drive with your uh, power and yeah. a good way is also to put a sleeve a small uh, uh the k wire bender can also be placed so that you avoid injury yeah. this what we learned from uh, joshi <laughs> yeah that's a very important advice uh, any sir case where... yes yes proceed proceed who wants to ask a question proceed yeah. any case where we have to insert the medial wire first and then the lateral wire yeah so many a times you know uh, there are the situations where we see the medial oblique fracture pattern and medial oblique fracture pattern if we pass the uh, first wire on from the inner half of capitulum it may not have very good purchase in the proximal fragment so there i start again i start from the lateral uh, most from the lateral wall the reason is once we put a wire across then you can extend the elbow and the fracture will not move in the lateral plane or to put a medial wire first if you have to reduce the fracture in uh, hyperflexion you will bring the ulnar now anteriorly and when you put an ulnar wire or a medial wire with a lot of flexion there is a high chance that you may injure the ulnar now so even in medial oblique pattern you can put your first wire from the lateral side which would be a far lateral and that will help holding the proximal fragment and that will allow you to extend the uh, the arm extend the forearm and that will leave the ulna nerve to slide posterior and so your chances of injuring ulna nerve is minimized okay sir two residents have written questions in uh, yeah. chat the one yeah, question please. is there uh, sir till how much days of late presentation you can do close reduction and pinning so uh, that depends on the uh, age of patient and your x ray findings you know so we have seen that some older children say more than 10 years they come as late as 2 weeks 
and they don't show any sign of callus formation on x-ray there uh, you can reduce them with minimal manipulation because many a times to achieve an anatomic reduction with lot of manipulation would invite myositis ossificans and a post operative stiffness so for children between the common ages between 5 and 8 years i tend to fix as late as 10 days and the decision is based on the displacement drill if it is severely displaced on x ray and there is no signs radiological sign of callus sometimes we see that there is marginal callus on the posterior side there we uh, and it is completely displaced little older child we do a percutaneous osteoclysis from behind and uh, kind of intrafocal joysticking we do and with that uh, blunt artery forceps try to reduce the fracture these children have significant remodeling potential uh, although it's a non growing or the less going end of humerus when the deformity is in sagittal plane there is a huge remodeling potential so any fracture for a child between 5 and 8 days if presents after 10 days it's not worth fixing it but we can correct the deformity later on if there is any restriction of uh, elbow flexion or cubitus varus deformity and sir the second patient one resident has written that uh, a anterior intrusus now divides below elbow and so wh what is the reason that it is the most commonly injured now in a supracondylar humerus fracture yeah that is a nice question and our teachers used to ask in our exam the uh, reason of nerve injury in supracondylar is never a direct penetration of a spike of fracture into the nerve it's always a stretching injury of the nerve all the nerves you see the anterior intrusus post intrusus they originate distal from the elbow but based on the fracture fragment or the spike it pulls that nerve and the nerve which enter into the forearm through the supinator their constricting region is when it enters into supinator so we see the anterior intrusus now pulse it's not direct injury by the fracture fragment children have very robust periosteum so it does not allow the bone fragment to move out unless it is an open injury so it's seldom uh, a direct injury it's a stretching of injury of the nerve and that's how the anterior intrusus now is injured yes thank you sir i request all the resident if you are having any doubts regarding supracondylar humerus fracture for exam clear it now you are having an expert so please clear all your doubts anybody wants to ask a question right so okay, okay sir. so i i thank you sir for your efforts and uh, for your time for residents thank you very much sir thank you very much sir and thank sir uh, yeah your next uh, request for you to plan a lecture on uh, cubitus varus and valgus and uh, uh, principles of management and uh, how to examine sir what are sure. the do's and don'ts you should do in exam so we yeah we should talk about that in next okay. and I'll, i'll let you know when it is right time okay uh, tell me your feasible day sir and uh, we'll connect sir okay thank you very much sir, sir. thank you very much to... yes sir, i wanted to ask one question sir Yes, proceed. Uh, sir, proceed. Uh, it was. It was. Yeah. Uh, sir, I'm thinking lateral condyle uh, non-union, sir. Uh, lateral condyle humerus union uh, case. It's a present for one year. Is there any difference of management? Yeah. We should get to clarity, but uh, the sir, the sir, I oppose the sir. so i i cannot hear hear you completely i mean you can put your question chat box and we can see there uh we like i could not hear the question i think something is pertaining to lateral condyle and i'm sure someone would be taking lecture on lateral condyle fracture management yes and then you you can ask to that faculty or i could not i could not get the question sorry sir uh, i i think he has written in lateral condyle non union presenting at 4 months and another patient is presenting as one year so is there difference in management regarding duration yeah so in lateral condyle uh, 
again it's a vast subject you know uh my clinical assumption when the fracture movement is there till 3 to 4 months we feel a clinical uh, movement of lateral condyle or lateral condyle non union and there is a big step off uh, at the fracture side one can try and still do an open reduction and align the fracture fragments the child presents at one year there are lot of resorption of the end of the fractures and you cannot uh, align it 100% anatomically even if you uh, open it the principle is to stabilize the lateral column because if you don't uh, stabilize or fix the lateral column or you cannot achieve lateral column union it will end up into cubicus valgus and later on a tardy ulnar nerve palsy so uh, in those cases where there is lot of resorption of the uh, fracture fracture site we tend to fix them in c2 with a, a, a cc screw and try to achieve compression across the fracture site and then there are more bigger uh, patients with non union and lateral condyle fractures and cubitus valgus deformity so there we some of them have movement through the non union site so if you fix that non union patient will lose range of motion so intraoperatively you have to put your uh, uh, thick k wire and see whether putting a wire across the lateral condyle whether it uh, reduces the movement or not if the moment stops then you should not fix that non union but just the correct the deformity uh, uh, proximally so lateral condyle is a big big subject lateral condyle fracture itself and we have to shift from one to the other classification from mill to jacob and jacob uh, like, like mercer ranks to big classification and now we all should know song classification so are you aware of uh, song classification no no sir so that uh, classification is very interesting and was explained on the uh, internal oblique x ray of the uh, elbow i i mean if you want to learn i can show that that was a power topic of my journal paper you want to sh uh, see shrikun that classification yes sir sure sir okay. sure so i'll take 5 minutes to explain to you yes sure sir and i'll share my screen again okay share screen okay A lot of things on my desktop okay okay so here it is so i'll i'll share the screen and uh, yes sir okay yes sir your screen is being shared okay fine so so this is like uh, we do journal club every week with my fellows and if uh, i'll share the link to with you shrikunj i i think these are we discuss uh, all jbjs and jpo recent papers and this was a paper published in jpo 2019 uh, from texas scottish right hospital dallas so and they have checked the reliability and uh, of this song classification so i'll quickly uh, go through what the classification so we when we were residents in two i'm talking about uh, 2000 and 2003 we used to follow milch classification that uh, milch a milch one is the the fracture which is going through the trochlea or capitulum and milch two is going through the trochlear ridge so if a fracture is uh, is lateral to the trochlear ridge that is milch one and medial to the trochlea ridge this is milch two and we thought that when a fracture is passing uh, milch two it's an unstable fracture and you fix it the problem is uh, in children the 
capital element trochlea is not ossified completely so we can't see whether the fracture is going through the uh, articular cartilage or not on just on x ray so this classification was not very reliable then mercer rank from sickids uh, toronto uh, they have done observation in 1975 and the prime first author was jacob so it is known as jacob classification and they have mentioned three classification based on x ray so the one is the lateral margin displacement is less than 2 mm so when it is less than 2 mm usually it is not going through the cartilage it is a stable situation you can uh, uh, fix it with uh, uh, you can treat it conservatively but when this distance medially as well as laterally is 2 mm this is an unstable situation and it is likely that it may get displaced laterally and when it is a rotated and flipped then you have to fix so again jacobs classification was relying on the uh, the dis displacement but as the distal part is not ossified we don't know whether the articular hinge is intact or not so then the third classification was devised in 2009 by david skaggs and colleagues and they this classification is based on intra operative arthrogram so they did arthrogram after taking patient into operation theater and type 1 is when they did arthrogram the lateral lateral pillar distance is less than 2 mm that they didn't do arthrogram type 1 can be treated conservatively now for type 2 and type 3 they did arthrogram whenever they found articular congruity is good they treated by percutaneous k wire but when the articular congruity was disturbed like in type 3 they did open reduction and pinning so ways classification should be followed so far people were following but the problem was problem is type 2 fracture because many a times uh, you don't need to because everyone cannot do an arthrogram so that was the limitation and sometimes even on arthrogram it looks well aligned articular cartilage but when people of opened up they found that that was not completely aligned so song this is the song classification which uh, all of you should follow and i ask my fellows to keep this two pictures in their consulting room and they have to define what now there are five types five stages they have mentioned and say for stage 1 the degree of displacement is less than 2 mm and you see the fracture site is only on the metaphysis it is not complete okay it is not touching here so this is stage 1 this is a stable fracture now this classification is based on one more view not only ap and lateral view you have to do an internal oblique x ray how you do internal oblique so you turn the whole elbow <coughs> internally by 45 degrees and that brings the fracture in its proper profile and in profile you can see the maximum displacement of lateral condyle fracture so so this is stage 1 where the fracture is only up to uh, the metaphysis and that can be conserved this is a stable situation type 2 as you can see the fracture is going all across the metaphysis and but the degree of displacement on the lateral margin is less than 2 mm so they found it is a stable situation and you can conserve it <clears throat> now the stage 3 is gap on the lateral and medial side is wide as 2 mm it is as wide on lateral side and the same wide Molin sir, can you hear me? Molin sir, Molin sir, can you hear me? Everybody, just wait for five minutes. Sir might have loosened the connection due to bad connectivity. 
as it's raining heavily in Ahmedabad. Molin sir, can you hear me? Molin sir, let me talk to Molin sir once. Uh, due to some reason, uh, Maulin sir has been disconnected. Right now, he is not able to uh, join the meeting again. If anybody is having any doubts regarding lateral condylar fracture or song classification, you can ask in uh, next uh, lecture of Maulin sir. We are planning a next lecture with Maulin sir uh, with the topic of uh, cubitus varus and valgus, principles of management and uh, how to examine a case of cubitus varus and valgus, do's and don'ts for a practical examination. Thank you very much. Uh, okay. Pachore, thank you very much, yes, sir. sir. I went for emptying the bladder. Okay, okay. <laughs> sir, due to some reason, Maulin sir has lost connection. I talked with yeah, him. Okay. So right That's now, okay. yeah, right now he is not able to. We will just close. Yeah. Okay. Uh, just Pachore, sir. That we are closing. Huh. Sure, sir. Sure, sure, sure. Okay. 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 Good night, sir. Good night.